Greetings again in Jesus' name. You can visit my website at standinthegap.org for any of the PDFs or files that we keep updated, loaded up there. You can download and use at your discretion. Or email me in my Holding Firmly account at uh, the gmail.com as I show on all the videos. And our YouTube account, you can go to Holding Firmly and type in Mike DeSario, Holding Firmly, Mike DeSario. will probably get a good selection of the videos unless you just run across them in searches or you know specific titles. I encourage you to uh, go and do that. What I want to do it again is go over the same thing we go over so many times before. Sometimes it makes me wonder if if I didn't clarify something the way people post and say things on the videos at times. But yet I go back and I listen and you say everything in almost every one of the videos in the lessons about repentance and faith proven by deeds. And I want to go through this again with you. First, let's preface this by saying that just because man has free will and unhindered ability to obey God doesn't mean he can save himself in the sense that he can just return to obedience to the truth and therefore he's okay with God, he's justified. No, the only way he can be justified of his past is have his past sins remitted. In that we need Christ's sacrifice that he did on our behalf, the blood of Christ. We have remission of sins through his blood. We have you know, forgiveness, remission of sins, the free gift that you keep talking about in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that's not of works is the gift of remission of past sins, which we go through repentance and faith proven by deeds. That free gift is granted of remission of past sins. It's not just we can just return to obedience and that remits our past sins. No, we have to have them remitted by the mercy of God in repentance. But the first initial act of faith is obedience from the heart. The scriptures teach that. And what people have done is take that away. They've taken that out of the picture altogether. You say, well, not of works means you do nothing. No, not of works means that you can't go back to the works gospel or the law gospel as su supposedly that I guess you people have in your mind that there was some kind of atonement that could be made for willful sin under the law. Well, there wasn't. The, the, the sacrifices and offerings that were made, even in the Day of Atonement, were only for sins done in ignorance. Look it up. Sins done deliberately and willful, you were already dead for those sins. There's a long list of those, those sins in the Old Testament for which the penalty was death. So there was no remission for those sins. So the only remission for willful sin was the possibility of repentance proven by deeds that the prophets offered the people time and again. And we see instances of it in Nineveh, in David, and in other instances throughout the Old Testament. And that's the only offer we have today for remission of our past willful sins for which we violated and the penalty is death. Christ didn't die so we can be removed from the penalty. See, you, you look at this as some kind of salvation is a transaction that the penalty's been paid in advance, that it's all been done for you. But see, that's not the case at all. All we're talking about is remitting past sin, not past, present, and future. Not a, a work that encompassed all of eternity so man can, can somehow be reconciled to God by just merely uh, acknowledging him. No, the first act of faith is obedience from the heart. You obeyed from your heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Having been set free from sin, you became slaves or servants of righteousness. That's what the scriptures teach. You obeyed even Jesus talked about in, in John chapter 3, where he where you talk about uh, John 3.16 all the time. At the end of that chapter, it talks about that uh, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe shall not see life. The word there is obey. Look it up. He that obeys the Son has everlasting life. He who does not obey will not see life. It's the same word as obedience in that scripture. 
That's why Paul says in 2 Thessalonians there that the raft and the judgment will be when he returns on those who what? Obey not the gospel. What's the gospel? Produce deeds worthy of repentance. What's man keep saying? Well, you can't produce these deeds. Because why? Well, they've already been done in advance. So that's what he keeps saying. He rendered obedience in our place. They keep going to places like Romans chapter 5. By one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Well, yes, yeah, certainly by one man's obedience, we're able to be reconciled through repentance and faith proven by deeds. But he didn't replace our obedience. He didn't become a sinner. He atoned for sin through his blood so that we can have release from bondage through repentance and faith. But he didn't obey in your place. That scripture doesn't say that he obeyed in your place. Then why, if that's the case, why didn't Jesus say that somewhere? Why didn't he tell when people come, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why didn't he tell them, well, I'm going to obey in your place. By my obedience, you will be made righteous. No, he says, by your deeds, you will be made righteous. Your deeds done in what? Faith. The first act of faith in your, in your repentance is what? Obedience from your heart. The preparation of the heart belongs to man. Proverbs 16.1 If you have a willing and an honest heart, you will hear from God. See, that's the reason people are cut off from God today, and they're into these fallacies that take away man's ability. So, if he rendered obedience in your place, became a sinner in your place, took your place, took the wrath of God, all that stuff that they keep teaching that was invented, you can go, all you got to do is look back in history and you can see it was invented in men's minds. It was never taught by the early Christians. Never once have I ever read any of the disciples of Paul, like Clement and others that followed in the second century, teach that, that the ransom was some kind of payment for our sins. There's no payment. Look at, the, look at the parable of the unforgiving servant. The perfect picture of mercy being granted to remit past sins on the condition that you follow in obedience, that you forgive, you forgive your fellow servants much lesser debts, which he failed to do. He came to the Father, which is God. He begged for mercy. Mercy was granted him. He remitted, he, he forfeited that mercy because why? Because he didn't follow through with deeds of repentance. He didn't prove his repentance by his deeds. But so you say, well, if man can do that, he can save himself. How does he save himself? By rendering the obedience that Jesus told him to render. Prove your repentance by your deeds. How, how does that save himself? He enters, he enters into this reconciliation return to favor process through that repentance. The sins can only be remitted by the mercy seat of Christ, by the blood of Christ, at His discretion. Otherwise, we're still in our sins. If we just render obedience and never do anything else, like people get into these 12-step programs, they quit smoking, they quit drinking, they quit taking drugs, all, all this other stuff. But they never render obedience from their heart. The heart is never purged and purified in repentance then they're still in their sins. They're still in their sins. You can't justify yourself from your past transgressions. But see, when you think sins of malady and not a transgression, like you, also, you people also think under this, this substitution model, well then, how can you repent from a malady or a nature, something inbred into you? You can't. You can only repent of the choices that you've made. And that's why man is still able to make a choice in his unregenerate state. I don't care what you people keep saying a thousand times if you want to, but the scriptures are clear. It's speaking to the scarlet sinner to cleanse himself of all filthiness and overflow of wickedness in the process of repentance where he's able to come before that mercy seat. If it doesn't happen there, it's never going to happen, folks. We've said a hundred times before. So he counted the cost in your place. He paid in full. He keeps the commandments for you. In other words, he fulfilled the law, so you don't have to keep it. I've heard people say that. Well, he fulfilled the law because we couldn't. Is that what he says in Matthew 5? He says, well, not one jot or tittle will pass away. And if you teach, other, te teach people to keep this, you'll be greatest in the kingdom. If you teach people not to keep these things that I tell you, 
you will be least, you won't be included in the kingdom. It's everything, everything's going, done. So bottom line then, you're pre-forgiven of your sins. Past, present, and future. Because you're going to sin all the time anyway. See, you, you people keep saying that, well, deeds will follow faith. Well, where are those deeds? See, where are they? I, I, just, I just don't see because the sin never stops. And the arguing in favor of sin never stops. No matter how many times, well, you, you try to tell someone that, that you're committing acts of fornication, and adultery, and porn watching, and all this other filthiness, but you're justified by just confessing it to God. Well, again, the fallacy of 1 John 1, 8 and 9 in your mind is so twisted. On one hand, you're saying you're cleansed of all sin in verse 9. And on the other hand, in verse 8, you're saying, if I say I have no sin, I deceive myself and the truth's not in me. Well, how can you be cleansed of all sin, but still have sin? See, it's twisted. It doesn't make sense. It's one way or the other. See, in the repentance proven by deeds, there is a purging and a cleansing. That's what takes place in a true confession. He who confesses and forsakes his sins shall find mercy, the proverb says. Not just merely confess and sin, repent, sin, repent. That's not any kind of a relationship with God. So you got your sins pre-forgiven, you're covered, you're clothed in His righteousness. You hear, that, you hear that from these people all the time. Your righteousness, nothing but any acts that you put forth as filthy rags, as though the bride is going to appear before the, the, in, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, in, his, in their filthy rags, and just covered and clothed and given a, a robe then, all contrary to the Scriptures. Your heart remains wretched, you're the wretched man, and you sin, and you think that makes you humble by admitting, well, I'm just a helpless sinner saved by grace. But sin hardens you. It's like Hebrews chapter 12, about beware of that bitter root of sin springing up by which many have become defiled. And then it gives the example of Esau selling his birthright. And then when he wanted to find repentance, he couldn't, although he sought it with many tears. And many of you people, you don't even see your need for repentance. You're completely seared, and you can say that you've committed acts of sin, and you don't even make restitution for those sins or any attempt to make restitution. And you say, well, God forgave me anyway. I, I say that's total deception according to the Scriptures. That's not what Jesus said when He said, go and sin no more. When He said, take up your cross. When He said, keep my commandments. He didn't say He was going to keep them for you. But that's what you have under here. So the result then, if... if if salvation is just this forensic transaction in which you accept the fact that he obeyed in your place, he rendered your obedience, and he transfers his righteousness and virtue to you, now you're cloaked, even though you remain wretched and filthy underneath, because none of you ever stop sinning, and you never stop arguing in favor of sin. So if it's just a transaction, then there's no deeds required, no deeds of repentance. You know the scripture constantly says, Bring forth deeds worthy of repentance. James chapter 2. You always say, well, the follow, follows faith. Deeds or works follows faith. Is that what James is saying? He says Abraham was justified by what he did and not by faith alone. I say it preceded his justification. Just like Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. Well, in the Hebrew, believed or faith means faithfulness. Abraham was faithful from Genesis 12 to Genesis 15, a number of years, a pattern of obedience established, and then it was imputed to him as righteousness. Not automatically while he was still whatever you perceive that he was in. Nevertheless, there's no deeds required. So there's no proof of faith, faith alone. Back to the Martin Luther heresy that fits right into this model of he rendered your obedience for you. No deeds of faith necessary. Why? Because they can't be rendered until you're saved. Well, how is that if it's the first act of faith, faithfulness, firm persuasion, fidelity of the heart, to follow after and obey God is what the word means in Greek and Hebrew. How is there no deeds to prove it? And why did James make it so perfectly clear in chapter 2? 
of James when he said faith without works is dead. So if you say you have faith, but you have nothing to back it up, no proof of it, it's faith of the devils, right? James 2.19. But if you have faith like Abraham, you walk in the steps of Abraham, you do the deeds of Abraham like Jesus said to the Pharisees. If you were the sons of Abraham, you'd do the deeds of Abraham, he told them in John chapter 8. So how can you have faith without the proof that it is genuine to begin with? So God gives you faith. Where does it say God gives you faith? Where does it say anywhere in the scriptures where did Jesus say anywhere that man was incapable of rendering obedience to what he said when he said, if you, you're not worthy of me unless you take up your cross and deny yourself, count the cost, strive to enter through the narrow gate, otherwise you're not worthy of my kingdom. Well, you can't preach that because you're already made worthy because he rendered obedience in your place. Romans 5 proves that. Well, if that's what you think, then you might as well accept universalism because it goes on to say there that by one man's righteousness, many will be made righteous. So the whole world then is righteous and obedient because it's already been done in their place. Or oh, they have yet to accept the fact. Well, I guess that's what you go out and preach then to get them to accept the drunks and the reprobates and, and all. That's why your churches are filled with that because they've prayed the little prayer, made the little acceptance, and then learned all the little cliches and excuses why they can sin and not die. So you got the, 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 the transaction, the package, the arrangement, as I've heard it called over the years. Reprobate preachers preaching a reprobated message to a reprobated masses that accept it heartily and go off and get their hearts seared with a hot iron because they will never break free from their sins. So no deeds of repentance, no proof of faith, and where there's no purging and cleansing, there can be no redemption. It's like Hebrews 9.14 says, how much more should the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works? Well, where is that going to happen? It's by this forensic arrangement? No, you're never purged. You're never cleansed because you never repented. That's why it's constantly falling back into willful sin. And the preachers tell you, well, 1 John 1, 9. Well, again, well, it says you're cleansed of all sin. But you say, well, I, I constantly have sin in me. So, bottom line, there's no obedience to the truth. And that's the only way that the heart could be made pure. First act of faith is obedience to the truth. By obedience to the truth, you purify your heart. So faith works by love, Galatians 5, 6. It works by love. The working principle behind faith that gives it energy, energio, power, dunamos, dynamite, is the love. The motivating factor to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, your neighbor as yourself, as Jesus said. Then obedience to that truth purifies your heart. That's why Jesus said to him in John 15, he says, you are already clean by the words I speak to you. Why? Because they were obeying those words. That's why. They were take up their cross and follow him. They left the world behind to follow Jesus. So they were already clean because they were obeying him. So no deeds, no proof, no cleansing, no obedience to the truth. So what's the consequence of this? Well, we see the, the dreadful consequences of it in our society all over the place. The people that just sin with impunity and have no consciousness about rendering any effort put forth to make restitution for the awful things they do to others. Because God forgave them. It doesn't matter. Bottom line, you're pre-forgiven, right? Under this mess that He rendered your obedience and transferred His virtue, so there's no purity of heart. No purity of heart. Peter said that, that in Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Council, when they were testifying about the Gentiles receiving the faith, that he purified their hearts by faith. Well, how can that happen unless faith involves the principles of obedience to the truth? It can't happen. There's no magic being done here, only the deeds of repentance through an obedient heart that's been broken and humbled to go through the process of a self-cleansing humility. So they can have their 
past sins freely remitted by that free gift of grace. So that's the consequence. No purity of heart. The flesh isn't crucified. Only positionally, right? Only by provision the flesh is crucified. You're no longer like Romans chapter 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, the body of sin might be done away with, no longer be slaves of sin. No, that, well, that took place in this forensic transaction, but not in reality. So the old man of sin still has dominion over you because flesh lusts against spirit, spirit against flesh, and you have no power over that. Well, I guess if sin's a malady and bred into you, you have no power over a malady. Do you have any power over any disease you might have inherited from your parents? No, of course you don't. Well, if you inherited the disease of sin, you have no power over that. You see how foolish that is? And God would be unfair to ask you to come clean constantly, to render deeds worthy of repentance, to amend your ways, to cast your transgressions away from you, and make yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Why should you die? He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. We say you've got to have his help. Well, you have his help. He convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment through his Holy Spirit, constantly through the preaching of the truth. He stretches forth his hand to a rebellious and stiff-necked people all day long. It says so in the scriptures. In Isaiah, at least two times in Proverbs, the first chapter is all about that, about him stretching forth his hand. He's not willing any should perish, but all come to repentance. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. In that Ezekiel passage, uh, Ezekiel 18. So he's there doing his part, waiting for you to do yours. But yet it's not happening under this, he rendered obedience for me. It can't happen. It's not possible if you accepted salvation as a transaction, or justification as a transaction. A forensic thing that has all been done for you. I'm telling you, this stuff was invented, folks. This stuff was invented by men, starting in the 12th century by Thomas Aquinas, and then codified by Luther and Calvin in the 1500s. You can look it up. None of the early saints taught anything about this, this supposed past, present, and future payment. No, they seen Christ as an example to follow. They've seen his blood as remitting their past sins freely by his love and grace. Yes. they also seen being redeemed from the corrupting influence of sin, like Peter talks about in his second epistle. Having therefore these exceeding great and precious promises, you are partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. Therefore, for this reason, be even more diligent to add to your faith. See, he tells you if you don't add to your faith, you're what? Blind. James says faith is dead if it doesn't accompanied with deeds. Peter says you're blind if you don't add to your faith. Add to your faith self-control and virtue and love and all those things he says in that passage. You've forgotten you were purged of your former sins. Well, most of you have never been purged of anything. But anyways, in the real sense, you have to add to the faith doesn't cease once you enter into justification at the mercy seat and are granted that mercy in remission of past sin, then you begin to add to your faith. You work out your salvation. You run the race with endurance. You make your calling and election sure. And an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into that everlasting kingdom. This is, this is the like precious faith Peter was talking about. This is the present truth, as he goes on to say in that scripture in chapter 1. The present truth was what? That, that what they preached about the cleansing and purging that happens in repentance. But no, under that, there's no purging, there's no purity, the flesh remains in, totally intact. It, Paul said the old, the, old, the old man of sin is done away with. He's destroyed in this repentance. You keep him alive so that you can serve the lust of the flesh. So then what do you get? You get a sin repent, Sin, repent, sin, repent. Because you always have sin. So everything you do then is filthy rags. Every act of obedience that you may render to God. I suppose your acts of obedience would be uh, singing in a choir or working at the church or doing, driving the bus or 
I was teaching a Sunday school class or working with the kids or a myriad of other things. Those are just filthy rags in his sight. Foolishness. Absolute foolishness. He who does what is right is righteous as he is righteous. You think righteousness is something magic. All righteousness is is moral uprightness and virtue towards God with purity of heart. That's all. Having your conscience clear before God and man. Is that so bad? Is it so bad to tell people that they need to render obedience to Christ in repentance? That the first act of their faith is obedience? That they don't have to get saved before they can render obedience? Man is fully capable of rendering that obedience, not to save himself, but to go through repentance. He can't save himself because he can't remit his past sins no matter what he does. That's got to be a free gift but he certainly can obey God. And if he doesn't, he'll never have his sins remitted. Never. So sin, repent. Everything you do, because all sin's the same, right? I've had people say, well, every idle thought. Uh, have you ever gotten angry with anyone or felt any resentment or bitterness towards someone or judged somebody unconsciously or consciously in your mind? Or they equate even breaking little civil laws like jaywalking or driving a mile over the speed limit or going through a yellow light, the same as the vile sins of the flesh that said to disqualify you from the kingdom. They equate it all the same. And you can't reason with them because, well, it's all pre-forgiven, right? James said if you break one, you broke them all. Now, that's not the point of James. James is talking about the royal law kept in a pure heart that has already cleanse itself of all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word that's able to save the soul. Being doer of the word, not a hearer, only deceiving his own self. To behold his face in that mirror and seeing that he's a man that's walking in uprightness towards God. Not a forgetful hear hearer of the word that looks and forgets what he looks like, still a wretched, filthy rags. So you people think you're royal sons in rags. That's That's... What, what the church so-called message like this in the church is producing. But that's not the case at all. Because the bride is going to have to make herself ready. Like Revelation 19 verses 7 and 8 talk about. The bride made herself ready and then was the clothed and the righteous and the white linen and the, and the righteousness. Which, and, the, and that was the righteous acts of the saints. That was doing what was right. So if I equate everything, every time you have an idle thought, uh, if you get a little bit angry, I mean, Jesus became angry and drove the people out of the temple. Money changers. Be angry and sin not, the scripture says. Feelings of resentment and those type of things. Judging someone, you have to judge. If you don't judge, you have no discernment. Make righteous judgments, Jesus said. Make a righteous judgment. The spiritual man judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no man, 1 Corinthians 2, 15, 14 and 15. You must make these discerning judgments so that you can discern between those who serve God and those who do not serve Him. And that's the reason they hate us, because we've made that discernment and that discretion between the two, just like the Scripture does between the righteous and the wicked. And that's why it's always hated. Because I pursue righteousness, they hate me, David said. They're in the Psalms. And the same thing, we pursue a righteousness and preach righteousness, and they hate us. See, we have a moral conscience in natural inclinations. Our natural inclinations of idle thoughts, occasional anger, a feeling that might cross, cross our souls against resentment or bitterness, it's nothing unless it's acted out. It's like James talks about in chapter 1. What, how, what, how does he equate the sin? He says it's conceived, the sin, the sin is conceived. He says each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my brethren. See, he's taken it on the premise of not sin in bread, not some kind of a corrupted malady within you, but your own desires corrupted. You have natural inclinations, natural human desires. You corrupt those. You conceive a corruption within you. Then you indulge that corruption. Then it becomes sin. The desire unites with the will. 
to commit the adultery, to commit the porn watching, to commit the fornications, the drunkenness, then it becomes sin unto death. A sin that can only be remitted in repentance proven by deeds. Not by merely saying, well, please forgive me. It's 1 John 1, 9. No, he can't be talking about presumptuous and willful sin unto death because he says there are sins unto death. I'm not saying you should pray for those. Those people need to return to their first works. Well, what's their first works? What's the crux of the entire lesson? The first works is obedience from the heart. Obedience. Faith. Synonymous. One and the same thing. Not two different things. One and the same thing. Faithfulness to God's commands. To render the deeds worthy of repentance as proof of your sincerity towards God. That's the only way you're going to come clean with God. So cast all the aspersions necessary to keep yourself in your nice comfort position that you're in. I fear people find a lot of comfort in this message, that they're safe in their sins. And they got all their little fancy cliches to cover it up, and some of them got it real down pat in the Scriptures, how to defend it, with their little snippet here and their little snippet out of Romans 5 and Romans 3 and, and all this other stuff. So they find a great deal of comfort, and they're not likely to give it up very easily. But the ones that are seeking to come out, to think they've committed the unforgivable sin when they finally still respond to that conviction of the Holy Spirit, that's the ones we've been working with. And I see those people coming to glorious in salvation in the truth when they find that purging and that cleansing in that humility of real repentance, realizing that they had the free will all along, that they had to put forth that effort, and then God would be there. Draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your, your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of God, and he'll lift you up. James chapter 4, 7 through 10. That's what you need to do. And that's what you're fully capable of doing and rendering to God through faith. Because the first act of faith is obedience to the truth. Then you'll be on the right road towards redemption. To strive to enter through that narrow gate. That's why Jesus said it that way. Show me anywhere where Jesus taught any of this stuff that he rendered obedience. He's going to transfer his righteousness. He kept the commandments in your place and he did everything for you in advance. Show me anywhere in his teachings that he taught any of that. No, you think you found it in Paul's writings, but you've been deceived by pundits of the past. Deeply, deeply deceived. You need to dig into the truth. First of all, you need to have a heart craving and hungering after God. Not one hungering after more excuses to be made in the mess you're already in. Because the only way you'll find that true path of righteousness is through repentance and faith proven by deeds.